Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 one five five two to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Jan Hammer's musical career is as firmly rooted in the fundamentals of classical jazz and rock as it is committed to the future of electronics synthesized sound, the possibilities of interactive media, television, film, and animation. His walls are lined with Grammy Awards and gold and platinum plaques from around the world. His name is found on scores of recordings spanning the 1970s to the 90s, solo albums, collaborations with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, Jeff Beck, uh, Demiola, Mick Jagger, Carlos Santana, Stanley Clark, Neil Sean, Elvin Jones, and many others. Jan has composed and produced soundtracks for a long list of motion pictures, the music for 90 episodes of Miami Vice, 20 episodes of the popular British television series Chancer, and the music for Beyond the Mind's Eye, one of the all-time best-selling music videos in Billboard chart history. In 1985, Miami Vice theme hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart, and in so doing became the first and only original version of an instrumental theme for television to reach this pinnacle of success. Miami Vice theme became a top five international hit and earned Jan two Grammy Awards, Best Pop Instrumental Performance and Best Instrumental Composition. Miami Vice soundtrack album stayed at number one in Billboard for 12 weeks, hitting, hitting quadruple platinum, and selling over 4 million copies in the U.S. alone, with worldwide sales in excess of 7 million as of this writing. Please welcome legendary multi-instrumentalist, composer, and record producer Jan Hammer to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Jan. Hello, I'm, I'm blushing. <laughs> well, I, you know, I had to cut it down a little bit because you got there's so much more going on. <laughs> a good, good you did. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're in your studio. I am uh, actually I am in my my living room in the house next to the studio, and I have to you know the line comes both places, so I'm it's more comfortable here to you know to have a chat. Exactly. I wanted to yeah. fir- I wanted to first talk about. Um, uh, seasons part one. Okay. Uh, I love the album, by the way. I gave it five stars. Uh, oh. t- talk about recording this album and when is seasons part two coming out? Well, it's, uh, I have been, you know, uh, sort of semi retired for quite a while uh, where I didn't perform live at all and just did, uh, you know, some soundtrack work. And, uh, but uh, all the time I was writing sketching stuff, which is, you know, what people do, I guess, if they have, if they, once you get inspired, right. you have to put it down on, on tape or in a computer or whatever we use these days. And I, it just started uh, reaching critical mass, but, you know, but there was just too many good things. So uh, that's how season part one came about. And there was like an overflow of both things. So I'm, you know, getting ready to, to do the, uh, do the part two eventually, but the uh, I'm very, very proud and happy with the the season, the part one, how it came out. It was, I just love the the variety of different directions that I was able to uh, c- compile into one, you know, concise album. You know, you got rave reviews from this thing. You're as popular as ever. Uh, 
you know, it, the uh, a lot of people are calling it Miami Vice 2020. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, there, there's there's no no mistaking. You know, it's it's sort of it's my second skin, <laughs> uh, and I you know I cannot uh, I cannot change my spots. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and obviously, obviously the, these things will remind people that, you know, for the huge volume of music that was, uh, used and written for the show for the, for the four years that I worked on it. I love and, every uh, track, man. Every track is incredible. Now, you play guitar on this? Uh, there is no guitar as such. Okay. But the guitar you hear is basically either sampled, uh, strings from a guitar. Right. And then, Manipulated, or actually just a synth played through an amplifier, you know, which has been my trademark for, de I guess, decades. Yeah. You know, starting with uh, with Jeff Beck and with Mahavishnu even, where it, it got to a point where I was slightly stepping on John McLaughlin's toes with playing so much like a guitar. <laughs> so that's something that I've always, uh, that, that was the voice that I always assumed it was, 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 was the strongest I could break through and it worked for me. Oh, it's amazing. You know, like Miami Night, I mean, the, uh, most of the tracks that sound, you know, like a incredible guitar player, you know, and it's, it's amazing what you do. It really is. Yeah. A lot of, yeah, a lot of that album, actually, I, I, uh, focused on, uh, as you go tune by tune, there's different sounding guitar like right. entity that enters. The, the stage and uh, about the one on, on Miami night is like pretty pretty powerful yeah that's like in your face <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, sweet uh, sweet Latin which I, it starts out kind of like a waltz opening it said that it, it sounds like a movie score and then the the track it kind of feels like a Santana finish you know on that <laughs> tune <laughs> yeah I, I, I remember when I recorded that I said this one. This one is for Carlos. Yeah, that's for Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I so love burning, it. Burning, burning section for for Carlos for for sure. Yeah, I'm half Cuban, so I really like that track. <laughs> oh, great, great. Yeah, no, I'm I'm I've absorbed so much Latin music uh, when I first lived in New York. And, right. You know, going to just listen to people like Tito Puente and exactly. and, uh, and Ray Barreto. I, I played with Ray Barreto on a on a on a Fania All Stars uh, record. Right. So I, I I was like you know absorbing all that stuff and it's really helped me uh, with my uh, with my vocabulary of rhythms. I yeah, I grew up my uh, my mom's Cuban. She passed away, but uh, you know I grew up with uh, Celia Cruz in the house. Oh. And, yeah. and, and then my dad's family was from Syria. So I grew up with the uh, the other side of that. Uh, I think her name was Um Kasum. She was a very big Lebanese singer, uh, huge. Wow. You know, she was like kind of like the Celia Cruz of uh, of Lebanon. So I, I had a lot of you know multicultural upbringings in my house. <laughs> yeah. And then I was in my room playing Led Zeppelin. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, I, I was brought up in a in a jazz. Hardcore jazz family. My mother was a j prominent jazz singer yep. in Czechoslovakia. And my father played vi vibes and that bass and you know, was a composer as well. But on top of it, he was a prominent cardiologist doctor. So he was quite <laughs> well well known around Prague. That's that's awesome. You 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 look like a doctor to me. You look like a cardiologist. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> On, I guess um, I look smart. <laughs> <laughs> what another track I loved was "It's Time." Um, it kind of had a Pink Floydish flavor to it, which I liked. You know? Yeah, yeah. It was it was something that I didn't have a name for the longest time. It was like an unnamed piece that I had, uh, you know, recorded and and just uh, loved it and didn't know what to do. It, it didn't end up in any soundtrack or anything, and then. Uh, but it was like the end of the album, and I said, "Hey, it's, it's, I'm going to call it It's Time." <laughs> yeah, and it just completely fits. You know, it's sort of a closing uh, statement. Yeah, well, it's perfect. I, mean, I love the album. It's 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 great. You know, it's it's you know you you got music that you can play anywhere, and you know it it makes you think. You know, I was thinking each title 
what each of the title makes you it, it gives you a picture in your head just the title itself you know of what the song's all about and uh, right right yeah it, it's 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 epic it really is <laughs> And then, uh, you know, I was looking at all the reviews on um, on Amazon and YouTube, and people are now, you know, right away they're dying for the, uh, uh, you know, the follow up on part two. <laughs> well, I have something. It's not quite a follow up. I was actually a, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of like a surprise, just to you know put in between the two releases. Right. I have a I have an, a, sort of an EP. It's sort of a short, shortish LP. And it's called Sketches in Jazz. Okay. And uh, it's coming coming out on uh, at the end of the month, uh, March. Oh, fantastic! And it's just uh, totally different. It's it's all the different things that I couldn't stop playing. You know, all of a sudden playing something jazzy. Right. And I would always put it aside and say, "Well, this is not what I'm doing anymore." But it was just you know my my fingers couldn't you know help it and just went went into it. <laughs> so there is a. Uh, a whole new collection of just sort of jazz-oriented pieces that I that's, that's coming out for now. That just to tie people over until I get to. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like, like a palate cleanser. Yeah, yeah. It, it's some, some, now for something completely different, as, as Monty Python would say. <laughs> well, you're certainly still in demand. That's for sure, man. <laughs> it, it really feels good. Yeah, yeah, it feels good to be uh, to be you know known and noticed and, and appreciated. And uh, I know that uh, my appreciation comes mostly from other musicians. For for you know most most of my life, there was always, as opposed to uh, a big public you know popular success. But I mean, Miami Vice sort of changed all that. Yeah. Because the thing blew up big time. <laughs> but uh, overall, you know, it's been always I appreciate when 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 I'm appreciated by musicians. It really means a lot. The, uh, you know, I mean, your resume is incredible. You know, one of my favorite songs, uh, albums with the Mahavishnu Orchestra was Birds of Fire. You know, to, oh, me, sure. to me, that's a masterpiece. And of course, <laughs> yeah, and of course. That was, that was just a great, I think that was the peak of the band. That was like, we, we were, by that time, we played lo long enough on the road to be like really tight, tight, uh, mach well oiled machine. And we also ended up going to like a fantastic studio in London, uh, the Trident, Trident Studio, Trident. where the Beatles did, you know, other than Abbey Road, most of Beatles uh, things were recorded there. Exactly. And uh, also with an engineer who recorded the, the White Album, <laughs> Ken Scott. Oh wow! So, uh, pardon? No, I was saying that you can't you can't beat that. <laughs> And the, we were just so blown away by the sound we were hearing on playback. Right. Because the first the first album, the Inner Mountain Flame, we were not ready to, to be recorded. We were just completely over over the top, playing too loud, and you know it was very ragged. I mean, the music is strong, but it all came together on Birds of Fire with the fantastic sound. And uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, that, that is my favorite, of, of course, of, of all, all our things. And another. Uh <clears throat> masterpiece, of course, was the Spectrum album, and uh, again, you were on that. You know, I, I I've been uh, talking to a lot of guys lately uh, that were in bands with Tommy Bolin, including Johnny Bolin, and you know, all, all the guys he was associated with. Right. Uh, it, and, and and I'm kind of friends with Billy Cobham. Uh, I've had Billy on the show a couple of times. We talked about Spectrum. Uh, yeah. He said he he had so much fun working on that album, you know, with you guys. Well, obviously it was just uh, it was something that totally unleashed, you know, the the, the amazing power of, of his of his drumming, power and control that he had. It was just, he is just one of the all time all time great yeah. great drummers. And uh, the, the, I remember he called me. Uh, he said he was going to do an album, and, and he just wanted me to, you know, help him organize it and, you know, put it into shape. So I was like, you know, hanging out with him and going through the tunes and or trying to organize it as a assistant sort of into in the production. Oh, what but, an but, album! Again, what yeah. was fantastic that uh, <clears throat> we were that was recorded at, uh, in Electric Lady, right? Hendrix's studio, and, and uh, again, the sound was just phenomenal, and. Uh, what what was funny though? Uh, funny story about that album. On uh, 
Platoon Quadrant 4. People were talking about how Tommy burned up the place, uh, you know, with the, with the solo. Right. Well, anyway, it was me. <laughs> it was you. <laughs> me playing Mini Moog uh, through an amp. Oh, and uh, it was like all these different guitar players, you know. It was like a, <laughs> the word got out. He says, "Do you believe it?" It was, <laughs> it was Jan. Yeah. It was just, it was great. But that's why after that album, I started putting uh, one line disclaimer on my productions that for those interested, there is no guitar on this album. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> it, it sounds so real. I mean, it's it's incredible the the sound you get. You know. Yeah. I mean, you don't need a yeah, band. I, yeah, I, that, that was <laughs> that was something I searched for a long time, and I could never get. You know, I, I started as an acoustic pianist. You know, right, playing right. straight ahead jazz and some studied some classical. And I, and once you get, you know, it, no matter what you do, you are you are stuck with a fixed pitch. The notes don't bend. Right. There's no vibrato, no bending, like a voice or a horn or a guitar. So I was trying electronically, you know, all kinds of modifications, and it wasn't until I got my hands on a Minimoog that I could do that. It, it, you are truly a electronic genius. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you meet? Yeah, um... right. I mean, I can I, I can solder a couple of wires together too. <laughs> I saw that. Uh, um... I was helping along when we were building our studio here. Yeah, you've had that studio for quite a long time now, haven't you? Well, yeah, I, 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 right after Mahavishnu Orchestra finished, right. or, you know, we let, we let it dissolve in the, the end of 73, I realized that I had, I had enough of New York City, that uh, the, the pressure and the, you know, the intensity was just too much, and it stifled any kind of a creative output. I, I was not writing much music, and... Right. and and then a friend of mine, Gene Perlow, a bass player, uh, and I started driving, you know, outside in the suburbs and further and further so we could find a place where we could actually play loud at night without being bothered. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found this place about an hour north of the city. And uh, there was, you know, two buildings and one, you know, one large enough to actually accommodate a studio on the ground floor. So that's how it started. <laughs> and this is a, uh, is it a farmhouse that you converted? Yeah, it's a it's a it's it's sort of a colonial farm farmhouse right. with a big barn and a guest house. And originally, the studio was in the in the main living, uh, you know, main house, the right. sort of the living room uh, living area. But then, once I got very successful with uh, Miami Vice, that some some money started coming in, so there was a way to reinvest it into music again. So we converted the barn completely into like a real, honest to goodness, proper studio. Huh. <clears throat> I like to see pictures of that. Is it? Do you have any pictures on YouTube or on uh, on uh, Amazon or anything? Not that's Amazon. Not, but... Just I think on, on my on my website. Uh huh. But I'm by the old. That's the old console and. Uh, yeah, there there are some pictures of the of the control room. I like to see that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really nice. Huh. Now you started out, I, th uh, I think, with Sarah Vaughn, right? Well, that was one of your first big uh, gigs. That was the very, very first gig. Yeah, I mean, I after I came here, I was in Berkeley School for like a year, year and a half, and uh, what happened? I, did, I didn't know what I what was like, what I was going to do at all. Right. But as I mentioned, my friend Gene Perlot, you know, that we you know bought the farm together later. He was a bass player with Sarah Vaughan, mm -hmm. and they played. They came to Boston, where I was living at Berkeley, and uh, I went to see them with Sarah. And, and Gene came up to me, and he, he heard me play, and he said, uh, "How would you like to go with us, play with Sarah?" Wow! You know, and it was just you know, total out of the clear blue sky, a bolt of lightning that sort of blew me out. <laughs> and that was it. That was from then. Nothing. I didn't stop. That's a great start. It really is. Yeah. yeah. And well, plus, I was totally ready for it because I was, you know, yeah. playing, being a jazz pianist. And also, I was accompanying my mother, this, who, you know, as I say, she was a singer. Yep. I, I was already uh, trained in the ways of accompanying jazz singers. <laughs> wow. So then I just, it was like really easy, really easy to step right into that role. Did you play with, uh, was it Elvin Jones also? Um uh, 
the jazz drummer? Around around that time too, yeah. like whenever there was some free time, yeah, I would always play. Gene and I would play with Elvin. It was just fantastic. Uh, I mean, Elvin is just, you know, what can I say about Elvin Jones? Yeah, yeah. But what was interesting is after, you know, after I bought the, after we bought the place and we sort of semi finished the first studio. Well, the very first recording we did here was Elvin Jones. Hmm. Yeah, his, his album called On the Mountain. Right. And there was just uh, Elvin, Gene, and myself, it, uh, trio, you know. With but I, I actually got to play synthesizer with Elvin Jones, which was just so out of the, you know, out of space if you think about it. Yeah. You know, such a <laughs> traditional Coltrane. Exactly. Yeah, and all of a sudden we are, you know, in a, in a new studio upstate here. <laughs> wow. And that, I, that, that album came out beautiful. It was just great. But it was like the very first recording here. Huh. And of course, we just lost a great in uh, McCoy Tyner. You know. Oh my God, I know. Yeah. I know. Great pianist. Well, you know, another legend this time. Oh my God, know. I know. I'll, yeah. Boy, what can I say? Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm a big jazz guy too, and you know, I love prog rock, jazz, a uh, little classical. You know, I I can appreciate great musicians and great sound. You know, it's it's. Yeah, I, I can't I, I can't settle on one. That's my problem. Yeah. <laughs> I will always have that problem with record companies, you know, when yeah. uh, they, would, they would assume they sign me up and do a record, and they would think like, okay, so there'll be some fusion stuff, right? Right. And then all of a sudden there are songs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we want piece that sort of like a classical piano and string. Exactly. And, and say, what, why, why don't you just do the one thing that, you know, you're pigeonholed to do? Yeah. And I, I just could never do that. No, no, your new album definitely demonstrates that. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the last album you put out, because uh, you do have, you know, like uh, Sweet European, you know, you got that very slow piano intro, then you got the va the violin, and, you know, it's, and then Winter uh, Solstice, which to me, sounded a little bit like Beethoven, Beethoven-like, <laughs> very epic, and then very classical, and then, you know, you had the guitar finish and Christmas bells and all, you know, it was really cool. <laughs> Very fun. I mean, that's the, yeah, I love the album, man. It's like, I mean, you hit a home run with that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, all your all your fans are you know, your fan your fan base is really growing, you know, which is amazing. Yeah, they always they always showed up. Everybody showed up. Exactly. Yeah. You, you've got faithful out there. You really do. I I did see the um, I saw your concert when you were with Jeff Beck. Um, I think you guys opened for Jefferson Starship. Do you remember that? Ah, uh, boy, where was that? Uh, God, that was in the late mid seventies, I think. That was a long right. Time. I mean, that's when yeah, that's when we did the most touring. But I right. remember where the gig was. Uh, I, I this was in Maryland at the Capitol Center. I mean, it sold out. It was like eighteen thousand people there, nineteen thousand people. But yeah, it was. I, I think I, I vaguely recall. I remember certain gigs. I remember very well certain I don't. I remember uh, playing Oakland Stadium. Right. Uh, which was this big festival, which was just an amazing, that was the biggest, you know, audience I've ever played for. Really? And to, to hear the, the sound of the synthesizer just like ring over the crowd and, you know, it, it's almost going into outer space. It was just so wide open there. Is it hard getting the sound you're looking for in a stadium? Well, if, if the, for 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 me, not really. I think the 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 more difficulties arise with drums. Right. When you have, when you get strange echoes, you know, like I remember we, we played in the Kingdom, which no longer exists in yeah. Seattle, and there was a covered stadium with with a roof, and the echo there was just killing us. Mm -hmm. I remember Billy would you know hit a backbeat, and you wait. One and a half seconds, and the backbeat would come flying straight, wow. straight back on us on the stage. That would it drive was, me crazy. It was kind of tough. Yeah, that would drive me nuts. <laughs> it's kind of like hearing an echo on a phone. You know, you're trying to talk, and you hear your echo on the telephone. You know, it's and it's constantly interrupting your next next word. Yeah, that's got to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was uh, you. You guys played with um, yeah Je- Jefferson Starship Open, but it was the good Starship because it was Paul Katner, it was Grace Slick. You know, it was like it was like the airplane actually. Yeah, that's the, the, the old airplane. Yeah. 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 Actually, you guys should have probably got first billing. You, you and Jeff Beck. <laughs> no, things things go up and down. It's, yeah. You, you ride these waves, so <laughs> yeah, it's all surfing. You, you, you and Jeff Beck. Same thing with you and Billy Cobham. You guys work so well together. Well, that, that's how you know birds of a feather stick together. Yeah, you know, ex- we, exactly. We both, you know, we think alike and uh, uh, anticipate each other, and you know, it, it's it's a very good good connection. That you know, like the best kind of musical connection when when you, you, you play and hear each other and in, in real time and. Uh, it's sort of like flying, flying planes, jet planes in formation, you know? Right. It's just uh, instinct and eye, eye hand, ear, oh, actually ear hand coordination. Yeah. Yeah. I've always loved Jeff Beck's work. Um, one of my favorite songs he does is Diamond Dust. Have, have, you, have you played Diamond Dust with him? Yeah, 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 sure. Oh, what a great song that is. Incredible. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if, you, if you've seen the, uh, there was a big concert that we did. After like about ten years of not of not playing, I went out to LA and played with Jeff at his uh, big, you know, big bash concert at the Hollywood Bowl. Okay. And uh, it was just fantastic. There was uh, I've, yeah, I've never been, to, I've never even been to Hollywood Bowl, but like to go there and play, there was it was like a real magical, magical all the lights and and anyway, there is a there is a fantastic DVD of the whole sh- whole, whole show. So oh, I, I gotta get that. Get a chance. Out. Definitely, I got to get that for sure. Yeah, so that was that was like a couple of years ago. So you know, uh, it was really really fun. Fantastic! I'm, I'm glad you told me about that. <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> you, you you did a um, a thing back in I think it was '83 uh, benefit concerts to raise money for Ronnie Lane's arms, uh, which right, is right. Action Come Research and, for MS. Yeah. And you had, there, there was a, uh, you, you did that with Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, Joe Cocker. Right, everybody. Uh, there was the, the Stones Rhythm Section, my the Bill Wan and Charlie. And, you know, it was, it was just, again, I, Joe Cocker was there, it was fun. It was just beautiful, beautiful tour. Yeah. What a lot. It, it was really great to hear, and uh, at, the, at the end of the concert, to hear all three of them, you know, the three, three giants. <laughs> yeah. Playing together live, that was just, you know, you knew that was special. And the, the, the other thing that blew me away, snapshots. Uh, you had uh, the promo video, Too Much to Lose, had Jeff Beck, David Gilmour, and Ringo Starr. <laughs> right. Oh, my God. Was, that, was, that was just was so much fun. It was, you know, on the record. I mean, I play all the instruments. I, I know, I can tell. <laughs> and then, we, 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 the idea was, you know, just let's, let's see who we can get to, you know, just goof, goof, and play, you know, play uh, in a video only. <laughs> and these guys just, you know, they were open for it. It was just great. Nick, it, yeah, they were having fun with it. I, it. You would go over, you would play guitar, and then Jeff Beck would take it out of your hands. Oh yeah. <laughs> And then Gilmore, okay, yeah, that, uh, you know, oh, yeah. Who do you think you are? Yeah, exactly. And, but Gilmore was playing bass. I, I knew something was up when he was playing bass. <laughs> well, they, we, we figured out, figure out between the two of them. I think Jeff wouldn't, you know, couldn't pass for a bass player. <laughs> so they they made a deal. They said, okay, I'll play bass. Okay, I'll play bass. That was funny. That was a funny video. I I wish more people could see that. You know. You know these things are. You know they go by and. Uh, Another year goes by, and two thousand other things come out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I heard that you had a lot of your material. Was it destroyed in that Universal fire? Well, uh, fortunately, uh, the things that were destroyed, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure which, how many, but those were the original uh, analog, t- you know, tapes. Right, the original tapes. Yeah, and all of that has been transferred to you know high definition digital. So. But nothing's lost, really. Good, good, good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, the, yeah, I, I have, yeah, I have all the all the stuff in digital. Yeah, that's happened to a lot of people. You know, losing losing a lot of their master tapes and, and things like that. You know, that's 
I guess it's... It was a yeah, you wouldn't expect, you know, the, the place is supposed to protect. It's supposed to be, you know... Exactly. That's why it was, <laughs> it's, it's in a mountain. Huh. Well, some people lost uh, music uh, studios, you know, with fires and things like that. Uh, yeah. that. That would be even worse, I guess. You'd lose your studio. Speaking of studios, the, the, one of the most beautiful studios ever. Yeah. I mean, that I ever w- worked with was the Caribou. Right. That's right. In Boulder. That's right. Uh, in the Chicago, Chicago studio. We recorded the... I recorded uh, the album with Jerry Goodman and myself, the, the White Children. We, we recorded that there. And uh, then, I re- then I did a couple of projects with Aldi Miola there, too. And that, that place is burned down. Wow. Hmm. It was just a beautiful, sort of like a little little town, a frontier town with log cabins. And the, in the middle was this large, large log cabin, which was the studio building. Right. It was just beautiful. Huh. I don't know how what happened or if it was uh, something shady went down. <laughs> really? You know, because the, I don't know, but it was just unbelievable that it burned down. Wow. I mean, those fires in California, they're, they're something else, you know? Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, we bound to have more of that, you know. Yeah, exactly. We were going. Your son. Is he still? Is he, he, something more cheerful? <laughs> yeah, your son Paul. Okay, he's in a he's in a, a pretty cool band, right? Oh, that yeah, that's his baby. Yeah, yeah. He, it's it's uh, it's called Savoir Ador. Right. And then they yeah they they've been they've done quite a few you know big things. They're actually better known in uh, Brazil. Right. People don't know in South America. And uh, parts of Europe than they're known here. I mean, they play here. They get you know good good people come. But uh, it's it's amazing how it's, there was one tune of theirs that uh, ended up being one of the main uh, pieces of music for the for for the video game FIFA. Wow. Worldwide, huh. and the music would play when you scored a goal. Really. And then what what we used to see on YouTube, like there were kids in Thailand. They're dancing to the tune on the YouTube. <laughs> oh, soccer just is everywhere. So that's how they they got like really uh, exposed to like a huge, huge with the rest of the world. That see, that's one good thing about today. You, you can make money selling your music to uh, you know games, you know video games and things like that. You know that's a another avenue. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. And you know, people remember that music. You know, they, especially the kids from from the video games. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But it's a it's a great band. I, I I see they had a couple of band changes. Now they have uh, is it Lauren Zettler and Alex Foot. Uh, right. And Andrew is now in the band. It's very good. I'm, I'm going to post the uh, information about the band uh, on all my websites so people can check them out as well. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, you know, I noticed there's a lot of um, uh, Czech American musicians out there. Uh, Jason Raz, he's got a background from. Uh, I don't know, that's that's the wrong Raz. <laughs> oh, really? Well, well, Jason Raz, I'm sure that he has Czech background, but as far as the, we think, of the, the musician I would think of is his name is George Raz. Oh, George Raz. Okay. Incredible jazz bass player. Right. And we came to, when I came over in 1968. We came together, and he he was. I mean, he played he played a long time with Oscar Peterson. Oh wow, jeez, he goes way back. No, no <laughs> I mean he's a heavy, 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 heavy bay, bass player. Yeah. So that's why I'm thinking, Raz, you know, but I'm maybe Jason. I don't, I'm not sure Jason Raz originally, but the name is Czech. It's yeah. Cross. Yeah. Yeah, his family. I think it's his family. You know, he didn't. He wasn't born there or anything, but he's he's got roots, I guess. Right, and even Tim McGraw, the country singer, has got a little bit of roots from there as well. What I understand, really? Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. I didn't know that. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Have you ever met Doctor Robert Moog? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> what of was course. that like? Very, very many times. He stayed at the, right. He stayed. He stayed here in my house. Did he really? Wow. It was. It was one time we were. Uh, he was. Uh, Upgrading my my keyboard, and he had some new he invented new filtering 
circuit that was like super duper. So he came over and it was like late and bad weather. So, you know, he was taking it apart and putting it in my keyboard. And then he said, like, let's just stay. You can just stay here. <laughs> How great is that? <laughs> He was wow. just a sweet, sweetheart, sweet, very sweet person. Yeah, guy. yeah. And super, super sensitively, you know, talented. Like, yeah. Just, and, and attuned to what's going on. He, he was, it was wonderful. And then there's Moose. Plus, you know, he gave me a lease of, lease of life with his instrument. It's incredible. Yeah. And then there's, of course, uh, Moog Fest. That, is that, that happens every year at Moog Fest? I think so. I don't know if, they, if it's, I mean, I, I, I played that on one of those. Right. Uh, that was at the uh, E.B. King's in, in the city, hmm. in, uh, in New York. I, you know, I, I, I love the Moog, and I love the synth- synthesizer. I think I started uh, uh, listening um, with the band, you remember um, Synergy? The Synergy album, Larry Fast? Right, right. No, I, 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 met, I met Larry a long, long time ago, yeah. Yeah, and then, of course, there's bands like uh, Tangerine Dream back in the day, you know. But uh, right. nobody mastered it like you did. I mean, you know, you, you sound like, uh, you know, you got a whole orchestra there. So, well, it's, it's just that. And also, I mean, I, I've concentrated even more on lead instrument as opposed to you know what I mean? The, yes. All the all the people you mentioned, they are much more of an orchestrating, right? Uh, an ensemble like sounding thing. I always w- work more like uh, so with you know having a obviously create a background, but uh, then over on top of it, be a you know spark you know a sparkle of a solo, real soloist, that solo voice that will take over and stand you know stand out. Yeah, so I think that's what really paid, you know paid off for me. Well, a lot of those guys cross over into, you know, progressive rock. And, uh, I mean, yours is more, um, more music. You know what I mean? It's, cause like you said, you, you do a lot of different things. You can play classical. You know, you got the rock, you got the guitar in there, which a lot of those guys don't have, you know, like, right, right. Exactly. They, they don't have the lead and, guitar and jazz <laughs> and jazz, especially jazz. <laughs> Especially, well, just, yes. I don't leave a stone unturned. You, no, you don't. You, you're it, very eclectic. You can do anything, which is which is incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And here, here's a here's a uh, a question I ask everybody, and I get some very interesting answers. Uh, if you had a field of dreams wish, like the movie, to perform with, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who, who would that be? And you work with everybody, so it's a hard question for you. <laughs> That's exactly what makes it hard. <laughs> you, you got, I got to meet uh, and play with Miles Davis, so, so you know that. I already did that. Wow. Uh, I worked a lot with uh, Tony Williams, who was my absolute, you know, heavenly drummer. One, you know, he passed away too. Yeah. And uh, as far as, uh, uh, yeah, I, I can't tell you because. And also, it's like what music specifically? Exactly. Yeah. It's like it's easy if you have a, you know if you have a rock guitarist and you will say, well, my favorite rock bass player, rock drummer. I uh, for me, it's not like that. It, yeah. It's you know. So I don't I don't see how I could answer. <laughs> <laughs> not completely, you know, leave out extremely essential. People. It's a tough one. It's a tough. Or you know, like singer singer like John Lennon. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's like nobody moves me like his his voice, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh and then Jimmy. I mean I by Jimmy I mean Hendrix. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh well, there was uh, I had a, one time lucky I, I met I met him and he came uh we were recording in his studio uh-huh. in uh the electric lady. And uh this was a few months before he passed away. He, he, and he was listening to us play and then we were you know, playing in the with the very early kind of sounding imp- improvisational jazz rock combination sounding music, and he was there, you know, checking it out, and he was like really digging it, and he said, "We should definitely, you know, when I come back, whatever, we'll, we'll, let's get together and you know, let's see what happens. Right. Let's, let's play." Well, he he never made it back. From yeah. England. You know, I could see him playing that. You know, kind of imp- improv and uh, you know. Yeah, but he was heading that way. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So that was that was like the biggest biggest shame for me that I missed you know largest miss that that I remember, but you know that was not to be. 
How about the, have, you, have you ever met um, Buddy Rich? Yes, uh, very thoroughly. Uh, but I definitely did meet him, and and we hung out in. Uh, this was one one of the early gigs I did with Sarah Vaughan. Right. And uh, what we did was we played. We believe it or not, in Disneyland, <laughs> LA, in Anaheim, and uh, it, it was Sarah Vaughan and Buddy Rich was the bill. Right. And then when we did the, the with Sarah, we we actually used. Buddy Rich's band and our rhythm section to back Sarah. Up. Oh wow! It was pretty. And Buddy was around, so you know, I got I got to talk to him. And yeah, so this this question is that it doesn't really pertain to you because you you met everybody. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Well, how about or, going or maybe impress you? <laughs> how, how about going way back, maybe Beethoven or Mozart or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there would have to be some, some dudes that improvise. I mean, Buck, yeah. obviously, did, did, you know, yeah. he would be he would be the one. And I, I, uh, I don't know if that's that's the the ultimate to me, but pro- probably Buck. Yeah. <laughs> Jan, you have anything else you want to promote, or is there anything uh, you know? What next? You got the uh, you're, you're going to be working on part two. Uh, you you have this, I guess, an EP coming out uh, at the end yes. of this month. Sketches, sketches in jazz. Okay, yeah, I'm, we're looking forward to that. All your loyal it's fans. It's digital only, so it'll, it, you know, they'll, they, 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 there's no physical CD. Okay. But they, I mean, nobody expects CDs anymore. It's like no, I know. This, yeah, it's a shame. But it's fine. It sounds good. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, all your, all your, uh, your, your, your listeners are foaming at the mouth, waiting for more music. <laughs> oh yeah, this is coming fast down the pike. Good, 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 good. End of the month. Excellent. And what what about touring? Are you going to do any more touring? No, no more touring. Okay. Yeah, I was hoping to see you here in Florida, but uh... <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm I've, I've done done it. I'm done with that. You're done with that. A lot of people are, you know. I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Jan, okay. thank you, thank you, man, for being on the show today. I really, really appreciate it. All right, thank you, thank you too. It was a pleasure. We love your music, and uh, we're looking forward to more incredible music. From Jan Hammer. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Bye. Take care. Purchase Jan Hammer's Miami Vice Special Edition at bookbaby.com and Jan Hammer Seasons Part 1 at amazon.com. For more information about Jan Hammer, visit www.janhammer.com, www.facebook.com, backslash official Jan Hammer. Um, also, uh, Jan's son, Paul Hammer's group, which is, there are, they are incredible. www.savoradore.com backslash welcome. And Paul Hammer's also on Facebook. www.facebook.com backslash savoriradore. Very special thanks to Elliot Sears of Eastern Music Inc. for arranging this interview with Jan Hammer and to the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of interviewing the legends. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com and please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho, for the very latest interviews. It is real news, people. And my new book is finally out. You'll love it. I guarantee it. It's called The Rockstar Chronicles, Series 1. Truths, Confessions, and Wisdom from the Music Legends That Set Us Free. Order yours today on hardcover or ebook at bookbaby.com or amazon.com, featuring over 45 intimate conversations with some of the greatest rock legends on the planet. Now I'm going to name them for you because you won't believe it. Chris Squire, Dr. John, Greg Lake, Henry McCullough, Jack Bruce, Joe Lala, Johnny Winter, Keith Emerson, Paul Katner, Ray Thomas, Ronnie Montrose, Tony Joe White, David Clayton Thomas, Mike Love, Tommy Rowe, Barry Hay, Chris Thompson, Jesse Colin Young, John Kay, Julian Lennon, Mark Lindsay, Mickey Dolans, Peter Rivera, Tommy James, Todd Rundgren, Dave Mason, Edgar Winter, Frank Marino, Greg Rawley, Ian Anderson, Jim Dandy Mangrum, John Anderson, Lou Graham, Mick Box, Randy Bachman, Robin Trower, Roger Fisher, Steve Hackett, Eddie Haslam, Melanie Safka, Patula Clark, Susie Quattro, 
Colin Blundstone, Dave Davies, Jim McCarty, and Pete Best. Wow. That's all in the book. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on PBS Radio, Station 1.